Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Herbert Nitsch from Austria, the deepest man on earth, and you're listening to Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Perfect. Herbert Nitsch is an Austrian free diver who has held the world record in all eight free diving disciplines. And he is the deepest man on earth. That means that he has gone to depths further than anybody else on a single breath of air and returned safely. And the only person who has broken his record over the past several times is himself. So not only are you the deepest man on earth, but there doesn't seem to be a challenger in the same vicinity as you. Well, there was a challenger that was myself. I was <laughs> always trying to beat my record. No matter if the, my record was the world record or not, it's about breaking the own record, uh, pushing your own limits and boundaries. It's the competition with the other competitors was not so much in the foreground and I don't know if that is the case in general with free diving is that you're just pushing your own limits and if it's a world record that's nice terrific well I also want to say that my son's name is Herbert and so finding another oh, yeah. Herbert of great renown is always terrific okay that's an uncommon name for American it's true well, he's actually my stepson, and he comes from a long line of Herberts. So uh, <laughs> he is the fourth. And, of course, over the years, uh, as I've gotten to know a couple of the other Herberts, they're of pretty good renown, too. So you're in good company uh, <laughs> on, on this side of the world. <laughs> Herbert one, Herbert two, Herbert three. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> it's like Dr. <laughs> Seuss book. <laughs> yeah. I don't know so many with that name. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about this Greek free diving discipline that you do because you break records in all the known disciplines. But uh, talk a little bit about that style of diving because that may be more of what people would think initially as terms of free diving and then maybe compare that to the high end stuff. Well, the discipline called Skandalopodra is from the ancient Greek free divers who did sponge diving and uh, collecting with this technique, just taking a stone plate, attach the rope and jump off the boat. And at the bottom of the, uh, on the ocean floor, they just put the stone under the armpit and collected sponges. And then they were pulled back up by the Colossieri to the surface by pulling in the rope from the boat. And they formed out of this Discipline the free diving, uh, which is basically the same, but well, the com difference to other free diving disciplines is that they do it without suit, without mask, just in your speedos. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, that's, I think, probably going for the most, I suppose, pure, unassisted, because when you're using a wetsuit, you know, you're assisting yourself in your ability to endure the temperature. But one thing that, as I, I told a friend yesterday that we were going to be talking to you this morning, <laughs> and he is a uh, scuba diver, and he said, yeah. first of all, he was astounded at 831 feet. He just couldn't imagine it. And he said, you know what happens at 160 feet? And I've never been 160 feet underwater, so I said, no, what happens? And he said, light ceases to penetrate the ocean. So you are completely dark after 160 feet. Well, it gets darker, yes, but actually there is some light even a bit deeper, but okay. it gets fades out even more and more. So how does it get at 831 feet? What Not necessarily even 831 feet, but most of the way down there. What are you experiencing physically in terms of you know all of your senses? Well, I'm basically focused on more or less the internal side, not more that I don't really look what's happening around me. Like most of the time I have my eyes shut and I don't even care what's happening around me. And uh, therefore the darkness is not so much a factor, 
And at the same time, there is a light shining in my eyes because of the camera on this lab to, to document my dive. So therefore, I'm even more blinded and more in the dark, let's say. So anyway, the vision is inside to check my body systems that everything is right and dealing with the pressure equalizing on time because one of the most difficult tasks is probably equalizing. And equalizing the, you have to equalize very fast. And as you go deeper, it's getting more and more difficult to equalize too. Equalizing is by pressing air, taking it from your lungs and pressing it through your mouth in your section tubes and sinuses and equalizing the pressure on the eardrum. Otherwise, you would first feel some pain on the eardrums. And then uh, after that, <laughs> Uh, getting more pain, you would probably get a rupture of the eardrum, wow, which you don't want to have. No, you don't want that to happen. It seems to the uninitiated that the biggest challenge is the holding of your breath. And really, people don't get further than that to understand the internal systems and the way that you have to deal with them as you go deeper and deeper. Yeah, Tell well, us about decompression sickness. Well, sorry, I want to go back a little bit about... The breath holding is one part of the, the factors that limit yourself, but the main fact is actually equalizing. Okay. That to equalize, first of all, fast enough, and also as the pressure increases, uh, it gets more and more difficult to get the required air out of the lungs and, and press it in your sinuses and oxygen tube to equalize. So therefore, I invented this technique of different equalization to equalize faster and deeper. Uh -huh. DCS is another topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hold it off because the decompression sickness is something you experience on the way back up. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the dive itself went fine as planned. The whole mechanism, the whole team performed to perfection. And then after leaving the target depth, uh, going back up at around 80 meters, I fell asleep. And at 26 meters, the sled stopped automatically with me on it. And the safety free divers found me there motionless and thought I had blacked out because of lack of oxygen. I planned to stay there between there and 10 meters for another minute to decompress, which is more or less the same as scuba divers do. Can I get that, you to press uh, pause right there? Because I want to ask, so, so you've already been down to say 800 plus feet. You've come up. And at this point, when you plan this break for a minute at about 100 feet deep, how long have you been underwater now before you start this um, decompression procedure? About four and a half minutes. Okay. Give us a moment for our listeners to understand that you've been underwater for four and a half minutes. And now you're going to take a break. Without the aid of <laughs> anything to breathe. And you're still on your way back up. And you're still strategizing about your ascent back to the surface. Yeah, this is what it did on the last record of 700 feet where I also implemented uh, the first time implemented the deco stop and the uh, results were very, very good. And that's why I kept doing that because decompression sickness does get a major factor on going that deep. So therefore you have to plan this deco stop. And I just planned it to be on one side uh, as long as I can, but not too long, not too push it too much otherwise I would have the problem of maybe blacking out because of a lack of oxygen so I figured one minute is more or less uh, good <laughs> okay good compromise yeah <laughs> I'd like to rewind because we've talked about this uh, amazing feat that you continued over the course of several years to to do over and over again and uh, you know you were only competing against yourself but let's rewind back to how you came to this particular art form 
<laughs> when, first of all, did you realize that you had a lung capacity that was unusual? And how did you come to the goal of increasing the depth of your ability to go further into the ocean? Well, my lung capacity, I found out pretty soon, was anything but good, because I also had chronic bronchitis and asthma, which is definitely not good for a free diver. So my total lung volume was not good at all. But throughout the years, I could expand it, even the doctor said it's impossible. But I expanded it quite drastically from more or less seven liters to up to 50 liters. Wow. Yeah, this is its own story. Before we even get in the water, the fact that you, you are a person who, you know, it's easy to say that, well, you know, when somebody has a great talent at something that they identified that great talent in their youth because they were better at a specific thing than everybody else, you found this, I don't even know how to grasp that you found this endeavor by figuring out that you had a diminished capacity. And yeah. that you started this with wanting to increase your capacity just to get to a place where you were comfortable with your lungs function. Well, the whole thing actually started even before that by a coincidence that I was going to a vacation in uh, Uganda, Egypt, and the airline lost all my luggage, including my scuba gear. And being on the scuba safari for 10 days, I was snorkeling only snorkeling and going deeper and longer every day. And then a friend was say, he was astonished about how I could dive and said, how deep and how long can you dive actually? And he persuaded me to take a depth gauge. And he told me I'm only two meters short of the Austrian record. I said, Austrian record of what? Because back then, even more so, free diving was not so well known in Austria. Wait, so what's your friend's name? I, we got to know who the instigator was. <laughs> Norbert. Norbert. He and everybody needs a Norbert in their life, and everybody has one. They're like, "Hey, go <laughs> do that thing," you know. And you're like, you "Yeah, know what? yeah." And he said to me, "Hey, buy some decent fins and set an awesome record." And okay, more or less. This is great, and Pete did. is glorifying him, by the way, because this is Pete in most people's lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see how further, how much further down underwater he, you can Did go. he ply you with beer or any kind of, you know, celebratory event afterwards? No, it, it was something, okay, you do more or less on vacation. It was nothing really special. Okay. And for a long time, it was a hobby of mine because I was an airline pilot. And through my vacation, some of my vacations, I went diving. So, so, yeah. I'm sorry, the, please go ahead. So, sorry. The competitors I soon met were like all like in this semi pro state and do it this way, that way. And I didn't have the time about learning and going into all those details, not even meeting those people frequently. So, more or less, I was on my own. And this was initially maybe harder, but then. It forced me to make find my own way. You were unencumbered by the rules. Yeah, by the rules and how people do it. Right. And this was very controversial at the beginning that people said, well, you shouldn't do this, this way, this way, this way. And in the first, in the beginning, I was a bit intimidated. But then I found, okay, I do it my way anyway. And then uh, soon I set some records and this still said, uh, you should do it this way, you should do it differently, but I didn't care anymore because I figured, okay, I tried and took the best out of it. You certainly did. Yeah. So when you find out initially that you're only two meters short of the Austrian record, we sort of jumped ahead after that. But tell yeah. us, so did you get some fins and say, well, I'm going to try it again? I got some fins, yes, but I skipped the Austrian record because there was some difficulties with the Austrian team because they wanted, of course, to be the winners. So I went straight to a world record and made it there. <laughs> I love it. I was going to say, did, yeah, did Norbit say, but the world record is another 12 feet or whatever it was going to be? No, no, the world record was quite some more. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> How much yeah, was the world record at the time? You ask me too much now. Uh, <laughs> like yeah, we're going way back. Something like 
between 80 and 90 meters, 80, okay. 88 meters. So okay. about 300 feet or so. No, a little less than 300 meters. Just, I want our listeners to have some reference here. At the time that you first attempted this, completely on accident and with the nudging of your friend Norbert, the the record was somewhere around 80 meters, and your yeah. record now is 253.2 meters. Well, that's a different discipline. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Because that's well, easy. <laughs> I'm talking about the discipline called constant weight, where you okay. basically swim with a fin or two fins down and up again without any change of weights. I see. Uh, that, that's why it's called constant weight. And there... The most competitive discipline was this discipline, where you swim down and back up again. And yeah, this is what I did most of the time anyway. There How do you is, keep your bearing, though? Like, you can be swimming not straight down. How is there like a the water version of an altimeter and a, a, a gimbal? You're a pilot. Yeah, so you do you have a gimbal as you go down to keep you oriented in the no. right direction? <laughs> well, instead of the gimbal, <laughs> you have a line. <laughs> it's very simple. Okay. Low tech, <laughs> following a line. <laughs> but also for safety reasons that you have a short lanyard, safety lanyard called, like uh, three to six feet, uh, connected with the Caribbean and following the line. So in mm. case you, okay. you can't lose it. And in case people go unconscious, they can just pull the whole rope up. I got you. Okay. And for the depth itself, there are so-called depth gauges. <laughs> <laughs> so you know exactly how deep you are or have an alarm even. But also for the records and competition, you usually announce which depth you're going to and they only lower the rope as deep as you plan to go. Like if you plan to go to 300 feet, they will put the rope to 300 feet. And the gauge is actually secondary. It's a rope that counts. And only if you turn earlier, they subtract penalty points anyway, plus what is on the gauge. So you're doomed if you don't make your target depth. But yeah, you better know well ahead what you plan and what you will achieve. Wow. This is all just so incredible. I mean, you... So you have multiple disciplines, and for you, they're very distinct. For us novices, it's sort of, you know, the same. It's He's just going down deep. But is one harder than the other? I mean, obviously, going deeper it seems to be the the harder thing, but maybe that's not true. Maybe yeah, diving without the weights is more challenging. Which one do you find to be the most difficult to figure out? I couldn't really see which one is more difficult than the other, but each discipline has a different hurdle to take like for a new limit where you get down with a sled and wait uh, you just you don't swim you just go down being pulled down and being pulled up obviously this is the deepest discipline also the film the big blue is about that yeah it seems most impressive because just the depth reached there is highest or deepest <laughs> so there the equalization is the most challenging whereas in constant weight and swimming down it's also equalization, but also the swimming part. So not to waste too much energy on the movement, but then not wasting too much time on going too slow. So you have to find a kind of a balance on that. Uh, which I find most annoying is the discipline called static, where you basically are in the pool or in the sea and just uh, with your face down uh, laying on the surface and trying to hold your breath without an emotion as long as possible. Oh, wow. This I find both annoying and a bit, yeah, for, to me, that's not free diving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, free diving that's floating in a tub. is deep diving. There is also the pool disciplines where you just swim up and down the pool underwater, seeing how long you can go. It's called dynamic. That with fins and without fins, you just go up and down the pool. And yeah, if you live in a landlocked country, that's maybe an option. But if you have sea, maybe you want to go in the sea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the ones in the sea are seem more robust, more romantic, more uh, adventurous. Uh -huh. Yeah. And to me, that's, that is free diving. <laughs> and the rest okay. is like in the pool that's swimming underwater to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You're in the pool. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've broken records 
the locations where you've done this include Geneva, Ibiza, Berlin, Weisbaden, v- Vienna. Let's see. Hawaii, where you said uh, this all started, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then in the Bahamas yeah. and Santorini. Mm-hmm. What is your favorite location? That depends on what you want, what disciplines. For example, the Bahamas, they have a very nice location, Blue Hole, and it's really right off the beach. Like five meters off the beach, you have 200 meters depth. Huh. So, and there's no current, no waves, nothing. That is for constant weight, close to ideal, but of course it's not deep enough for no limit. So therefore, yeah, you have to find different places for no limit that are suitable and good at the same time. So that's why I choose Santorini because there of this Greek island, it's very close to the island, very deep because it's volcanic initially, and uh, therefore it's super deep, very close to land, and close, uh, close to land island, meaning it's sheltered from wind and waves. That's why I chose it to be there. This episode of the Break It Down show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at the Break It Down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. So waves make it harder. And then when you go for these deep dives, do you always have a full team or are there practice dives where it's just you and and Norbit or someone like that? It depends a lot. Like in the Bahamas, where the blue hole is, there there were all these competitions. So I trained with other competitors, Hmm. maybe even direct the rivals. And we just lived together. We were in houses there and so on. Yeah, we have a big team, but a team consists of I'm doing safety for someone, he's doing my safety. And during competition, there's uh, judges as well and doctors and some safety divers, but it's for the whole event. Whereas uh, you make the event yourself on the limit. Because the limit is so complex that you only have, can have one diver and you need a team for each person doing different tasks, like one doing safety only, one uh, managing the, the winch system, the safety system, the safety board and everything. So that's very complex to guarantee safety there. And that's why it's only done by one person at a time. Oh. It's also outside the competition because it's way too comp- complicated to organize a competition of several free divers trying to achieve records. But it's the same organization that initially sanctioned it. Right. Oof. Initially. They stopped. <laughs> okay. So this is such an elite yeah. an elite field of competition. How many competitors actually are, you know, is there a a field of I imagine you all know each other. Um, and that the number of people who participate in this sport at the level where you have to take seriously that they're doing doing serious work is pretty small. I obviously know the top competitors and, of course, including those that go to many, many competitions. But the, it's very small, actually, people that travel all over and compete at the top or compete at the top. Hmm. We're talking about, I don't know, maybe... Those who know maybe 50 people or more. Wow. Not said that on the competitions all over, there is many, many more. Huh? I'm just saying one person is trying the competition here, another person is trying there. So if you don't go to all the competitions, you won't see all the people. <laughs> right. I, so there are a I bunch of people some... doing like you did in Ergata, just trying it out and seeing how far they can go and developing their skill. But in the field of competitors who are looking at each other seriously and see each other as, as contenders, about 50 of you. Not really. Uh, it like in Uganda, when I dove first, it was just Kubo Safari. It was nothing like a competition, freedom, no other freedom. Right. I'm talking about other freedom in competitions 
where there's always different people all around the world. Many of them happen, for example, in Germany is very active, but of course they're all holding only pool disciplines. Right. And initially I went to a lot of competitions all over the world, but I slowly went to less and less and very selective because I only wanted to go to uh, close to ideal locations like in the Bahamas, on the Blue Hole, like uh, I went to Greece for some competitions. Initially also to Dahab, e Egypt. In Dahab is also a Blue Hole of the beach, but it's only like 80 meters. So that was initially nice, yes, because of the beach, very shallowed and also kind of cheap <laughs> and super nice underwater life. And now it's politically maybe not so ideal. But also, I stopped way early going there because it was getting too shallow. Huh. Uh -huh. Wow. I stopped going there because it was getting too shallow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How is the sport financially supported? Because it's not like you can sell tickets to a stadium where people can watch <laughs> you free dive. You're going places where you can't even see. We certainly yeah. can't see what you're doing down there. So uh, Yes. Yeah, it's kind of a niche market, niche sport. That's sure. why there is little money in it. But also because of that, there is uh, not so much direct rivalry because it's more like you're friends with even rivals because mm -hmm. if he wins or you wins, well, you're not getting any poorer then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and everybody's advancing the sport. I think there's probably a component as well that fosters that environment because you're risking your life. I wouldn't see it that way. I think if you do the sport safely and it's uh, well away from being very dangerous. And I wouldn't even ex think of it an extreme sport because okay. the risk you're taking are kind of are very predictable. Whereas in other sports, which I think of extreme sports, you have any, uh, many variables that you cannot predict, like climbing, click, uh, jumping with a mountain bike, and so sure. on. You don't know how the crowd is going to hold up and so on. Yeah, and so wind, free anything. The, yeah, so there's so many unknown variables uh, which but can control. You can when free diving, as long as you make it safe to some part, you're conscious of the safety. And if you're doing safety for each other in a reasonable way, it's not dangerous at all. But Okay, so I understand that you guys account for a lot of safety, but there's a lot of people that do this that end up... Heck, you've had decompression sickness, and uh, uh -huh. Audrey Mestre, or I'm not sure exactly how to say her last name, you know, Mestre. she... Mestre. Mestre. She passed away. People do pass away doing this, so from the fans' vantage point, we're going to go, oh my gosh, this is such an extreme thing, because you push yourself to the limits of known body performance. Like, you, were, you've talked before, and I've read about how like the I think it's the pancreas becomes a third lung almost as it crushes down and puts oxygenated blood back in your body. That sounds extreme to me, man. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yes, it sounds extreme. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, let me go back to deaths, fatalities in the past of free diving. In the case of many people that died, it was a lack of safety and not a risk of you're doing something dangerous because like also flying used to be very dangerous and uh, like with their brother rights it was kind of dangerous probably back then and now it's one of the safest uh, vehicles huh? and the same is with free diving that people still do it nowadays on very limited safety and to my understanding they're they're just asking for trouble Okay, um, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. like if you talk about the li no limit discipline, where you get to go down with a sled and with a balloon maybe up. All the other people who did that, including Audrey Mestre and Luc Leferme, who both died, it was a technical problem that they didn't get up in time. Well, they only had one lift bag. I never had only one lift bag because, yeah, if there's so many things that can go wrong, the holes can go out to lift back, the valves can break, the lift back can break, can break off, can rip, whatever. 
And I had this happen in the first first test. So I don't know if you really want to take the risk. Yeah, I think you're in deep shit if you if the something breaks, literally. This is why uh, fatalities happened in the past, because people did it very unsafe of point. So we're talking about a lack of safety practices, not a risky behavior that you typically don't see at the at the top end of the sport where you know if your intention is to break a world record you're going to gather the team you're going to do a lot of research as to the conditions you're going to choose the perfect time you're going to choose the uh, you yeah, know, the that's conditions what you that favor all of those things so that's what okay. you would think yeah that would, would make sense but i'm telling you that <laughs> in the past until now Everybody else, everybody, not one, everybody else, was doing it to my eyes very unsafe. Yeah, of course we are talking about people who did world record like that. Yeah, you can't be safe just because it wasn't done very often. Also, it didn't happen very often something. So people didn't think it's not so dangerous. Yeah, because if you do it, only do it twice a year, the chances are not so high that something happens. So now I want to get back to crushing your pancreas and getting a shot of oxygenated blood as you go deeper because I'm just sitting here waiting for, oh my God, you know, to even come up with this concept. So is this your concept? Talk to us about the limits of what you can do because apparently you can't just go for the record each time. It seems like there's like about a five-year gap each time you do it and really go deep. So to give us the idea of what the limits look like. Well, I don't know. <laughs> well... You have to understand, and I learned throughout my freediving career, what's happening inside the body and how to manipulate it in the best way. For example, knowing that the spleen contracts and uh, expels oxygenated blood in the system, that the dive reflex itself uh, is something known in medicine, but what is not known is how to trigger it and how to make it more effective. And this is what I expanded upon that how to make it more effective and more and more and more like for example the dive reflex consists that your heart slows down immediately as you put your face in the water uh, called bradycardia well this is one thing but also the peripheral vasoconstriction that the battle vessels in the extremities like the legs and arms contracts and therefore circulation is limited to the main organs like the the center of the body the yeah the brain and the lungs itself only and yeah and there's all kinds of mechanism that happen automatically but also if you let it happen or even more if you train that it happens even more effective and initiate it before the dive for example what it did, uh, yeah, the last many years, I would just dive to three uh, before the actual record attempt. I dove three times to with empty lungs to like 20 meters, just to simulate on the body a lot of pressure, and at the same time initiate the dive reflex already by having uh, like a semi vacuum in the lungs. And therefore, the blood shift would already start. So the whole dive reflex is already started before I do the dive. So when I actually do the dive, it's more effective. Huh. And that's why I can dive deeper, equalize deeper, and hold my breath longer. Fascinating. So it's, uh, yeah, it's like a journey inside your body. 800 feet below water. <laughs> So okay, <laughs> and a journey that very few other people have ever taken and have navigated completely differently. Yeah, I like to think That's for sure as you're down there because there must be a lot of specialized gear. You know, the sleds. You can't just use regular swim goggles. Do, do you have to use goggles? I, I see pictures of you with them on, but is that required or is that for style? Talk to me about goggles. <laughs> well, <laughs> to the goggles. guy who keeps his eyes closed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends on the discipline. And also, initially, there was a rule that you have to use the standard goggles. Mm. Then ah. it came uh, like specialized standard goggles. <laughs> and then the rule changed that there is no goggles anymore. But also, 
like uh, sorry, special mask, not goggles, because goggles you would think of like just around the eyes and not the nose. Right. Whereas a mask usually includes the nose too. And I already back then came up with a so-called fluid goggle, where this was a mask without nose piece. This is not used for deep diving, for free diving at all, but because you can equalize it. Because you on a normal scuba mask, you have to equalize the mask too by pushing air into it as you go deeper and not to get squeezed yeah. at depth. But then I used this mask and just uh, put a pipe to it, a pipe from the mask in the mouth and equalized through that. Not my ears, but the pressure in the mask. Mm. And I used this for quite a while, actually. So the pipe mask. <laughs> wow. And uh, then some other gear I used was also, I started first with a monofin, because back before me, that uh, all the free divers used uh, bifins or regular two fins. And I figured from speed sw uh, fin swimming, they always do with one fin, one monofin. So I figured, well, it's, it's better for speed swimming. It's probably better for deep diving too. So right. I tried that, even though in the beginning, ah, everybody was laughing at me. <laughs> and uh, then after setting a few records, and now everyone is using it. <laughs> And it, it, uh, it's also better for dolphins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works better for dolphins. And there's not so many fish with five fins. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask, yeah. who's making these rules? I mean, there's one person and it's you who's been to these depths. Who's, uh, who gets to sit there and go, you know, uh, Herbert keeps going deeper and deeper. I think we need to adjust the rules. Oh, well, um, I tried to influence the people that were in charge. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, it was a bit of a bit difficult because like in all federations, the people in charge are maybe not the most uh, sportive guys and more like behind the desk <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of people. So this is also why I stopped competing a bit because I was fed up too with the rules and uh, trying always to uh, go in between the rules or, or to make them work. Let's put it that way. Right. And, and I have to question at what point their motives should be examined because, like you said, they're not the guys enduring these conditions. They're not the guys who are competing in the sport. They, they're in these regulatory bodies, you know, there's a safety component that has to be examined, but you leave the rules in the hands of these guys who just don't understand what it's like to go down there uh, from anything mm -hmm. more than a textbook standpoint. Yeah, well, you say safety point of view. Yeah, but the problem I encountered was that the, I had to find ways how to make the safety with the rules. Because right, the, right, yeah. the rules were against the, let's say, modern safety. Mm. And uh, they simply didn't know uh, about how to do things safe. And uh, basically the rules forced me to do it unsafe. So I tried to like steer them a bit that I could make it safe or how, yeah, find ways how to circumnavigate the rules a bit. Just Take note, regulators of the world. <laughs> hey, I want to say real quick, we're talking to Herbert Nitsch, the deepest man on earth. You can find him on Twitter at Herbert Nitsch. You can also go to his website, which is Herbert Nitsch. And also he has an organization that deals with cleaning up the oceans that he works with called Sea Shepherd. So that we're talking to Herbert Nitsch, and he is an incredible an incredibly talented person. I want to get back to your regulators. One of the things I've noticed throughout my life is, yeah, it's the people that don't take the risk that always have the crisis for you to deal with. Like, I'm about to go 835 feet deep and, and break the you know all the records that have ever been set. And you guys are all of a sudden putting a cry. Like I should be focused exclusively on this, and you're going to have me jump through these hoops and 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 change things. And you're you're going to create a crisis for me that I don't need right now. It's funny to hear that that exists even in your world because you know, John's world, my world, we all have these things where you're like, I just need to do this thing now. It's time. I'm ready. Let's go. I know what I'm doing. What um. 
How do you navigate that, though? Like, you know, the International Deep Driving Federation, and then there's the Deep Divers Association, you know, or whatever, all these different bodies. <laughs> do you have to, do you have influence as the guy that's going the deepest and cutting the edge the most? Um, yes, I had some influence, but mostly on the no limit, because basically I was the only one doing it for a few years. There, I could implement some uh, changes because I said, well, it has to be this, this is safer, uh, a lot safer, and it doesn't benefit anything else but safety, and it only allows safety. So there I could change it, but in other disciplines, I could not change it. I tried, and I was frustrated not being able to change it. That's why I stopped competing in those disciplines mm. also because, yeah, because I, I concentrated then on the no limit in the last couple of years. Yeah, because getting fed up with the federations. And also on the last record, uh, I disinvited the federation uh, <laughs> because of not being allowed to do it as safe as I want to. Yeah. And I invited other federations to sanction the dive. And there is still some people saying, well, you didn't do it with that federation. Well, they didn't allow the safety and were way behind in their thinking. I figured, well, I'm diving deep, it's my safety. Yeah. And I don't care about any other federation. Terrific. So, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're rebels like that. I applaud that uh, that spirit because ultimately, if what the Federation is doing is holding back your ability to to perform at, at the highest and safest level, then what good are they? And if you're the only guy, then they have to cater to your ability to do it safely. And, and I appreciate that you would say, OK, well, you guys aren't invited then because that really just takes the legs out from under them as a Federation. They've got one guy who's, who's uh, breaking the records, and in their opportunity to foster uh, greater performance through greater safety, but well, they missed the boat. Yeah, literally the boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> because the record, the record was of a boat, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. How do you grow the sport then? If, if you're the one guy who's out there doing it and the and the governing body isn't really allowed to come out on your attempts because they're a problem, how do you identify the other people out there that maybe have a penchant for this and would enjoy it to help the sport evolve? Well, there is, of course, these other disciplines. There's plenty left, which there are competitions in. And eventually, I hope the safety is going to catch up with them as well. Uh, before there is more victims and yeah I can just hope for the best and uh, I personally yeah gave up in trying to change it and yeah let's oh, see man. if it does what, so l let me ask the big question how deep do you think you can go uh, is there another 800 plus foot dive in your future I guess first and then how, how far do you think you can go in that next attempt well, my plan initially was to go, which I did, 600 feet, 700 feet. The last attempt was to 800 feet, the last record, and then was 900,000 feet. That was my goal. And I still think that humanly possible, why this accident happened was where some other circumstances. So I think it's possible, humanly possible, to go to 1,000 feet. And I think it's even possible to go deeper, but to go deeper also involves getting more and more risky. Mm. So this is why my limit was and is a thousand feet. Do you feet. do you have a thousand foot dive in your future? Then is that happening, or or has the accident sort of taken you out of the the deepest dives? Well, at the moment, I don't want to break a record anymore. But I'm not saying that I'm completely over it. Yeah. That yeah, I've been diving already deep, uh, like only two years after the accident, and diving just to see how I feel, and I felt great, as nothing has happened. So from that point of view, everything is fine. It's just that, yeah, do we need to prove a point <laughs> or not? Like many experts believe that you should never dive again, but 
also those experts said it's impossible to dive so deep as it did. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So you kind of question their validity. Yeah. So at the moment, I don't think about breaking the record, but I never say never again. Yes. Well, but, you just yeah. celebrated your 47th birthday. Happy birthday, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What do you see in your future besides free diving for, for a guy who has many, many years, several decades uh, ahead of him and who's accustomed to achievement as you are? What else do you want? Well, uh, presently, I do a lot of lectures all over the world about risk management, stress management, also combining the medical side uh, with the aviation side early on. And another thing is Sea Shepherd, that spreading awareness for uh, protecting the oceans, uh, the overfishing, the pollution, the plastic pollution, and so on. Because as free diver, I, I see many, many, many remote places, and everywhere I get aware of less fish and more pollution on the very end of the world. Like, and yeah, and I just try to spread the word there that something is happening before it's too late. And I just finished writing a book, my biography also. All right. And it was the most challenging thing in my life, actually. The free dives were super easy compared to that. <laughs> yeah, so I finally finished the book. And yeah, so that's something we just doing some editing, actually translating into German, having it done by somebody else, hopefully with my F input too. <laughs> but you wrote in English first. Okay. Yeah. Well, we look and forward to the, the book coming out because you're a fascinating guy. I can see how uh, you would be an attraction on the lecture circuit. Your achievements and your, and your personality yeah. is a combination thank you, thank that you. I think, yeah, a lot of people can find and apply to inspiration for whatever it is they're doing. Because let's face it, when you think you're having a bad day, all you have to think is, yeah, but I've never been 831 feet underwater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Not to say that for you that was a bad day, but when I think of a challenge. You know, where the bar is in, yeah. in terms of challenge, yeah, then, then I, can, I can always just think back to, uh, well, okay, but it's not 100, 831 feet below. I find it, I am just, boy, it's, uh, this is quite an admission, but I'm a terrible swimmer and I'm just getting back to, I shouldn't say back to because I've never been a Holy waterman. Feet. I'm just figuring out how to swim. <laughs> okay. Which is to say well, that I've always been the guy who said, well, if I get thrown in the water, I can make it back to the boat, but I'm a terrible swimmer. And, and so, John comes from an island, by the way. <laughs> I'm from Guam. <laughs> okay. Where are you from? I'm from Guam. Ah, Guam. Okay. Yeah. But well, you know, there, but only on the trip to Palau. Okay. <laughs> well, there are plenty of places there. to dive deep around there. Yep. Yeah, Palau is really, really uh, fish rich, whatever the underwater life is really nice there. And that's yeah. why I love it there. And there are wreckages and I, I, to dive in that area as well. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. But uh, I, I have a real appreciation for the watermen in and around us we've had uh, laird hamilton on the show also oh, yeah. And yeah. he's really one of the reasons and now you the reasons where i realized that i've been depriving myself of the adventure of the water in my life <laughs> so i'm gonna figure out how to swim a little better and then maybe get scuba certification someday <laughs> and not necessary i don't have one you don't have one okay <laughs> no. good it's not, not necessary. necessary they were always a rule breaker <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Only was, in the water. I was, I was by the book as a pilot. <laughs> of course, of course. Only in the water. Yeah. Uh, Are you flying anymore? No, I stopped in uh, 2010. Oh, okay. Yeah, because now, well, actually, I came just back from the Haiti, French Polynesia, just being on vacation, let's say, five weeks off the beaten track, and to see how the underwater life is there. So. Mm. That's what I mean. I don't have the time. I want to waste the time on other things than traveling around and uh, giving a lecture now and then. Well, that yeah. sounds like pretty, pretty interesting life. 
I have an idea yeah, cool. f- for a, a a job you can do too. You should be. I live in Southern California, so you should come to Hollywood, and you should always be the guy that's in the water when they're going deep. Like James Cameron is going to go film something, and you should be out there shaking your fist at him. You know, be the uh, the angry old man <laughs> in the sea. You know, or any submarine movie. You're like, hey, you, you know, you're not the only one down here, kind of thing. Like you can make <laughs> yeah, a little well, extra money. James Cameron went a bit deeper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a bit. He's got a he's got a, a a tank though, you know. Like you, you, the fact that you've dove deep than deeper than several submarines could even go is is is, is deep enough, man. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was always uh, a dream of mine to knock on a submarine's window, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's what I wanted to hear about right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Terrific. Well, we'll look forward to the book coming out. We're fascinated by your work. We appreciate your achievements. And we also want to make sure that everybody uh, supports Sea Shepherd. At least go take a look at the work that uh, Sea Shepherd is doing. You can go to seashepherd.org. and. Yes see a lot of inspiring video and content about uh, defending and conserving and protecting the oceans, which is your domain. And we appreciate all that you've done in that regard. So thank Thank you very much for being on the show, Herbert. And I'm once again, glad to find yet another Herbert doing great and interesting things. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. It was very interesting to talk to you. Yeah, and when you have the book out, if you want to come back on, by all means, please feel free to uh, to jump in. And for those that are uh, interested in what Sea Shepherd's doing also, I want to support them. We'll put a link on there so that you can contribute to them through uh, Charity on Top, our official charity of the Break It Down <laughs> show. And again, you can find Herbert at his website, herbertnitch.com. He's, yeah, man, seriously, thank you very much. It's almost hard to conduct the interview because it's like you're just trying to keep up with what you're doing and the things you're inventing and, and how you see the world it's just fantastic and so i personally would love to talk thank to you, you thank again. you yeah yeah where are you actually are you in la where are you i'm in orange county by disneyland oh orange county okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. i'm in san francisco oh okay that's a bit far <laughs> it's cold <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we have water up here too but it's less pleasant to get into yeah i've been a couple of times uh, in the la area also did some flying hours in out of Orange County Airport. Oh, okay, yeah, that's ten minutes from my house. Yeah, yeah. If you're in LA, come on, <laughs> we'll come, we'll come out and hang out. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. If you make your way to the Los Angeles area, because I go down there all the time. Uh, but yep. if you do make your way here to California, we'd love to hook up with you and maybe do a uh, a live podcast while we drink some coffee. Okay, great, good, terrific. Thank you, Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye bye, Herbert. Day.